Just because the Supreme Court ruled it doesn't make it right, and therefore it violates natural law. Welcome to the Thursday segment of the Liberty Lineup Show. This is the Naked Truth segment where we think right and wrong, not right and left. With Ben McClintock and Enoch Moore from Defending Utah. Today we've got a a really good show with uh, candidate for governor Jonathan Johnson joining us. And then later on in the show, we'll be talking about how to tell the difference between the two different stories going on up in Oregon. So stay tuned and bring your friends. We'd like to thank our show sponsor, EOS Mobile, the only cell phone service that gives you the peace of mind that your monthly bills are supporting only conservative candidates and causes of your choice. I think that's a really important thing to, to point out, that these are the causes of your choice, including this show. Call 877-367-7524. Be among the first 10 callers during this show today, and you'll get a special offer if you mention the Liberty Lineup radio show. Call now. Eight seven seven three six seven seven five two four. For more information, go to the go to eocell dot com, e o s c e l l dot com. Just a reminder that you can listen to the Liberty Lineup online by downloading the K Talk app to your smartphone or at k dash talk dot com, where you'll find our calendar of events and the chat room. You can also like K Talk's Facebook page at K Talk Utah and post photos to Instagram at KTalk Radio and tweet our handle at KTKK. Help us spread liberty around the world. Okay, now that we've gotten all the business out of the way, let's let's get down to business. We're welcoming um, candidate for governor, Jonathan Johnson. Appreciate you joining us. Ben and Enoch, thanks for having me. And as a businessman, I know you've got to have sponsors to pay the bill, <laughs> so I'm, I'm always willing to sit through the, the advertisements. <laughs> Got to pay the bills. That's right. So we remember at uh, Eagle Forum convention a couple of weeks ago, and you had mentioned that you wanted a, a vigorous and uh, complete um, interview process. You actually asked us for this interview <laughs> when, you, when you said that. I, I, and I'm, I'm very serious about it. I'd like a rigorous interview process. You know, my I'm asking Utah to hire me, to hire J.J. Uh, as its next governor. They have a choice. They can hire J.J. or they can rehire Gary. But as the job, as the interview committee, I want all Utah voters to put us both through a rigorous interview process. So you know, all questions are open. You know, you can ask whatever you want. Uh, I'll be as straightforward as I can. And I may even say, I don't know, if you ask me <laughs> something I haven't thought about before. Awesome. Well, I hope that uh, our listeners will... Uh if if you have if you, if you're listening here and you think we're not asking uh, the right question, give us a call at 801-254-5855, 254-5855. And uh but to, hopefully I think we've got some questions that uh you might not get on other programs as well as hopefully really kind of hold you to it because just full disclosure, I think and and you don't have to be as as rough as I am. I think Gary Herbert just come back. So uh, I think my, my job is probably the, the job to just have no filter and just to say what I think. And then, you know, being being the guy running for office, you know, doing how you do it. And uh, but so full disclosure. But at the same time, full disclosure, the other way is just because I'm I don't think that the guy in there now is holding to the proper role of government and he's not promoting the principles of liberty. We want to make sure that, um, that people know that the other alternative isn't just going to be status quo 2.0. Does yeah. that make sense? Yeah, and yeah, but I can assure you, I don't view myself as more of the same. I, I view myself as a, an alternative that's looking to bring uh, more power away from the federal government to the state government, but more importantly, devolve power away from the state government down to individuals and families. You know, my view is that individuals make the best choices for themselves and parents make the best choices for their family. But the further away you move from an individual and a family in the decision-making process, 
the more adverse, the, the more negative, you know, a bad decision becomes. So mm-hmm. I like city government more than I like state government. Mm-hmm. I like state government more than I like the federal government. And to take the ridiculous to the absurd, the UN. <laughs> th- th- there we have no say over what happens. So the, the more we can devolve power down to or near the individual and the family, right. the better. Gotcha. So you're, if you're, you're saying local is better, which we all agree with, the more local, the more power for the people. So that, that makes me think briefly about the caucus system and um, count my vote and the SB 54 fiasco. And I think what people really want to see is that is the caucus system preserved and they would love a governor that would uh, do something to completely reverse the whole SB, SB 54 and count my vote fiasco. Well, how do you feel about that? Well, you know, I think their governor Herbert tries to have it both ways. When he gets in front of one group of people, delegates, he says, I'm all for the caucus convention system. When he stands in front of count my vote supporters, he says, I'm all for SB 54 and count my vote, which he signed into law and he's, elected to go and gather you know, signatures to be on the ballot. Uh, I've been a precinct chair in two different precincts. I've been a county delegate. I've been a state delegate. I am a state delegate right now. I think the caucus convention system works really well. You know, some say, well, it's, it's too far to the right, or maybe on the Democratic side, it's too far to the left. Uh, that's not my experience. You know, sure, there are people on the extremes at those conventions, but when I talk to people, I talk to good, hardworking Utahns who care about what's best for Utah. And I like it because it forces candidates to look voters in the eye, answer questions in a intimate situation, and let voters you know, measure the candidate up and down. Uh, the last 12 to 18 months, I've been traveling this state. And I tell you, I learn things when I'm in Hurricane, when I'm in Helper, and when I'm in Hiram. Uh, and I think I'm going to be a better governor because I've been holding town hall meetings uh, in anticipation of going to caucus and convention and using that way. And I've elected not to gather signatures and not to use the petition method. Could I? Of course. But I think it's bad for our system. I think what it does is it it's an incumbent protection plan. Mm-hmm. Those that have money, and frankly, incumbents have the most access to money because lobbyists are coming in front of them all the time with asks, and with asks come money. Um, th- they can easily gather signatures. And when, I think it's telling when you look at the state legislature and who's filed uh, to gather signatures. Eighty percent of those that have filed to gather signatures for state legislative races are incumbents. <laughs> a mere 20% are challengers. That tells you incumbents think it's an incumbent protection plan. Right. It's, it's a couple of things that you mentioned there I think is really interesting that they would claim that it, it fosters extremism on both sides, but the delegates are chosen by those in their community. So that means they're accusing the communities of being extremists. Yeah, I don't find that. I mean, sure, there are those that come to caucus. I've been to my neighborhood caucus meeting and seeing extreme people, folks that I thought was extreme. I mean, extreme is in the eye of the beholder. <laughs> but fo- folks that I thought were extreme stand up and say, I want to be a state delegate. And the neighborhood say, no, no, we want somebody different. Um, and so whoever gets elected is someone that the neighborhood caucus attendees say, this person represents our value. We trust this person to do the work. And boy, I will tell you, Delegates do the work. Mm -hmm. They are not, uh, sure, there are some ideologues, but there are others that just say, I want to figure out who the best candidate is. And candidates are forced to talk to them. You know, if we go to a strict petition or a strict primary ballot, just like there are flyover states in a national election, we will have drive-through counties Mm -hmm. in Utah. And, you know, a candidate on the Wasatch Front can pay money, can pay someone else money to gather signatures, never go to a single door, him or herself, run an expensive media campaign, and never leave his or her home on the Wasatch Front. Never see rural Utah. I don't want to be the Wasatch Front's governor. I don't want to be the tech industry's governor. 
frankly, I don't even want to just be Republicans governor. I'm a rock rib Republican. I want to be Utah's governor. And that's what the caucus convention system does. Uh, last night I was in Riverton. 50 people came out to the town hall. I answered questions all night long. And you know what? I think I'm better for it. I think I'm better prepared to be a governor today than I was yesterday morning because I did that many. The night before was in North Ogden doing the same thing. The night before, we had a telephone town hall all around Utah talking to people about Second Amendment rights. I think I'm a better person for campaigning throughout the state rather than spending money in a media-only campaign. Mm -hmm. Would you have vetoed SB 54? Yes, I would have. Yes, I would have. And I think, look, is the caucus convention system perfect? No. Personally, I'd like to see a higher threshold to avoid a primary. I think a higher threshold would be fine. We could have our state delegates vet people put two up to a primary. You know, the, the threshold's been as high as 80%, then it was 70 and 65. I'm not wed to 60%, but I think this notion that count my vote encourages more participation is hypocrisy. When I was getting ready to run for governor, I, announced, I was called into the office, downtown office of a big count my vote supporter who twisted my arm saying, don't run for governor. We have a good governor. And I said to him, but you've been a main proponent of count my vote under the theory that it encourages participation. <laughs> and yet here you are twisting my arm to not run against an incumbent so that no one runs in against an incumbent. That's not encouraging participation. So to answer your question again, Annie, yes, I would have. So that seems disingenuous at best and dishonest at worst. Yeah, I thought it was hypocritical. Yeah. So you, you mentioned the Second Amendment. Um, last year, the governor vetoed constitutional carry. What do you think about that? Well, and I've, I've told uh, Representative Kurt Oda, who was the sponsor of that bill, and when Governor Herbert vetoed it in 2013 in the last two years, he's basically told Representative Oda, you pass it, I'm vetoing it. I've told Kurt, I'll sign it. I'll sign it. You know, I don't need a permit to exercise my First Amendment rights of free speech and free free uh, practice of religion and, and freedom of assembly. <laughs> I'm not sure why I need a permit to exercise my Second Amendment rights. Right. Now, you know, I'm not opposed to background checks. I don't think, you know, to me, keeping guns out of the hands of criminals, that makes sense. But but I would, I, I've been very public saying I'd sign an open co or constitutional carry bill. So, so forever, though. 20 that, seconds to break. Oh, Lena. okay. Shoot. Okay, so we will go into – I want to go more into detail about that aspect of it and some other aspects. And we've got uh, people calling in and that have their questions as well. But um, we, want, we need to – we're heading to a break. So I am Ben McClintock. And Enoch Moore. With the Liberty Lineup, and this is the Naked Truth segment and on am630k-talk.com. We are talking with candidate uh, for governor, Jonathan Johnson. Go to our Facebook page, the Liberty Lineup Radio Show. Like and share. And after the break, we'll be back with more questions with Jonathan Johnson. This is Ben McClintock and my co-host, Enoch Moore, from the Liberty Lineup Naked True segment and DefendingUtah.org. We are on KTalk Radio AM 630, k-talk.com. We were the, the Naked Truth segment where we think right and wrong, not right and left. We are sponsored by EOS Mobile, the only cell phone service supporting conservative causes of your choice. People are asking how they can join our grassroots network to get our updates and alerts. Just go to libertylineup.com. That's libertylineup.com and sign up. And if you like what you're hearing, you can support the cause of liberty with a donation of any amount. That's libertylineup.com. You can also like and share our Facebook page, the Liberty Lineup Radio Show. And we are back with candidate for governor, Jonathan Johnson. Appreciate you again coming Thanks, up. Being man. On. Thanks, Enoch. It's good to be with you. We were Before the break, we were talking about um, the, the veto the governor did on constitutional carry and how you wouldn't have vetoed that because you talked about not having a permit to practice religion and you don't need a permit to practice the Second Amendment. And a couple, one thing that you brought up that uh, is, is a question that, that I've had is um, talking about uh, background checks for criminals. And that sounds really good, but is that um, a violation of the Constitution that says that no, um, 
that uh, what's it called? That cruel and unusual punishment is, is a life sentence from being able to own a gun a reasonable thing for a felon. So. Thirty years ago, I, I committed. No, just I didn't. Just saying, you know. It's Thirty a, years ago, a hypothetical. hypothetical. <laughs> I, I would. I would have been not old enough to commit a felony. I hope. Thirty years ago, but um, if I had thirty years ago committed a felony, was that reasonable that I still not allowed to own a gun? Man, I think it depends on the felony. You know, I think it depends on the felony and how we want to punish people. Uh, and so, back. I think background checks are important. You know, what we decide to exclude in background checks. That's an area we can debate. You know, so would that be a state issue, background check, as opposed to a federal background well, check? Look, the more things we can make a state issue, the better, in my mind. And, you know, I, I think about the Tenth Amendment, uh, and it specifically says those, you know, what is given uh, in the Constitution are specific enumerated powers to the federal government. And then what's not specifically given is left respectively to the states and what most people forget are the last four words, or to the people. Mm-hmm. Uh, I yep. think we're at a place where we have we rail against the federal government to give the state government more power. <laughs> we should be railing against the state government to devolve more power back to the individual. Right. Well, let's let's briefly, just, since you brought it up, Don. Hold on. You want to? Okay. Uh, you go one first? more question okay. on the gun okay. thing. One more question. Sorry. One more question on the gun thing is um, the the idea of having a permit to cover up the gun but if i carry it openly i no longer need a permit i don't understand the logic in that well i mean i i think having it concealed you know th- that's the law today if, right if there's an open what i've what i've said is there's an open carry uh bill i'll sign it well I open carry is already legal in utah oh op- well constitutional i mean i think oh, okay. open carry is the bill or the constitutional carry is right. you know a concept of Where's the bullet? You know, is right. it is it chambered? Is it ready to go on an open carry? That's today. That's not legal in Utah to, to be chambered, right? To be chambered without a permit, and, you yeah. know, and that's that seems problematic to me. So okay, let's go. So let's go to what you were asking. Okay, me. so and we've got we're going to our callers in just a second. We've got yeah, a, a thanks, lot. callers. Just hold on there. So uh, you you spoke well on what the Tenth Amendment is. So I assume you seem to understand it. Uh, then. The question is how you enforce the Tenth Amendment, right? And so if there's federal overreach in a situation, do you, do you spend years begging the federal government to please stop? Or do you simply say, okay, the power, since it's not delegated to the federal government, automatically I have the power right now to just do X depending on the situation. For example, um, there is being there the whole uh, marriage thing as governor um, – you don't have to listen to a, a federal judge making a ruling outside of enumerated powers. There's no authority there. The authority still resides within you or within the people if the state doesn't do it, for, for example. So I guess basically what we're asking about is nullification. And if you support nullification in, in principle, there are a lot of legislators that that argue, oh, we shouldn't just nullify things. That's crazy. That's, you know, we're going to start a civil war. But But the reality is nullification is used regularly, but... It's kind of just when it suits um, someone's agenda, they'll use it. If it doesn't suit their their agenda, then they'll argue well, we should take it to the court and fight the federal government and and that sort of thing. So nullification, would you support nullification? And would you just simply take a stand and just do the right thing if you have the power to do so? So let me give a little bit longer answer than a yes or no, Ian, because that's okay. an important question. I think about what President Reagan said in February of 1982. At that point, he'd been president for 13 months. And he went in front of the Indiana State Legislature, and this is what he said. The federal government operates under the outdated and arrogant assumption that the states can't manage their own affairs. If that was true in 1982, boy, (laughs) it's more true today in 2016. And why is that? I think there are two principal reasons. One, the federal government is this ever-expanding blob it's trying to get more, insert itself into our lives more and more and more. The second reason, and this is where a governor can make a difference, is the states let the federal government do that. And they let the federal government do that by looking to the federal government for solutions and for funding. Take a look at uh, what we've done with education in the state of Utah. We've said yes to Common Core for federal funding. The governor lobbied hard last just one month ago to get every student succeed act passed in congress 
What a wonderful name for a bill. Right. What a, but what a terrible idea. It gives the uh, Department of Education full veto power over the state's education plan. We've sold our education birthright for a mess of federal funding pottage. States have to first, in asserting states' rights, first we have to stop looking to the federal government to solve our problems. Then to your question, what happens when we're not even looking to the federal government and they encroach into our lives? I think nullification is a good is a good option, but it needs to be used carefully. If we use it on something where the federal government push push comes to shove and it goes to court and a, a judge and ultimately the Supreme Court overturns the ability, you know, the concept of nullification, then we've hurt ourselves. We've been short sighted in our pushback. We have a, we win the battle, but we lose the war. So my, my view is we pick the ones that will help us win the war. Do you think the federal court has the authority to overrule the concept of nullification? Uh, well, I'd hope not. But, Enoch, you know, the federal court is pretty activist, and their interpretation of the Constitution is not so infrequently different than what I learned uh, when I was in law school about the Constitution. Something Thomas Jefferson said when a court ruled against him was he told the court to enforce it, meaning they can't, just told them to, to, to stick it. And so... Um, as a as a governor, what would you kind of hold to that idea? The, the Supreme Court at one time held um, the idea that blacks were less than a full person. So just because the Supreme Court ruled it doesn't make it right, and and therefore it violates natural law. So how far does that go of submitting to the courts? Look, I think there are times when we got to push back and push back hard in the courts. But you know, we can fight every battle, or we can pick and choose the battles that will help us mm-hmm. win the war and get the courts to relinquish some of the federal government's power to the state. So the answer to your question is the principle of nullification is something I understand and I espouse. When it's used, though, I think needs to be done carefully so that we don't actually weaken it in its use. Okay. How about we nullify all federal funding for education, just cut it off, well, you know, be I was, done with it? I was down in uh, Spanish Fork last Saturday morning as the Utah County Republican uh, leadership met, and they passed, I think, by a vote of 222 to 4, uh, a resolution supporting just that. Uh, and you know what? When, when I think about K through 12 education in Utah, it's about a four, roughly a four billion dollar budget. Uh, it's about a 300 million dollar amount of that that comes from the federal government. You'd think for all the uh, restrictions and hoops that we jump through for the federal government, that it would be a much, much larger percentage than 7-ish percent. Uh, by the way, $300 million is a little is about 60% of our current surplus for the budget year. We could keep education well-funded and eliminate or incrementally move away from federal funding on education. Which brings us to one of our callers, and with that um, answer to that, you, you just released your education plan. And so with, with maybe addressing her question, um, and I'm, I'm hoping it's a her. I'm sorry, caller. Jan- Janissa? Jenica. I'm sorry, say it again? Jenica. Jenica, sorry. Okay. Jenica, go ahead with your question. Jonathan, I saw that you released your education plan. I saw it on Facebook yesterday. I just wanted you to tell us more about it. Jenica, thank you for calling in. Uh, I did I did release my education plan, and there's two basic principles to it, is that we need more localization in our education policy, and we need more uh, personalization. Um, local control is key. Just like I don't like the federal government telling Utah what to do, I don't like the state school board in Salt Lake telling local school districts and local principals what to do. Uh, I'm opposed to Common Core. Uh, I think what we ought to do is we ought to let the school districts decide what standards and what tests they're going to use. The state school board could put together a menu of appropriate tests that let us measure, uh, let us measure so we can see how we do school versus school, state versus state, but then let the Granite School District you know, choose to follow the Iowa Ames test. And if the Alpine School District wanted to follow a Common Core and Sage Base test, 
They could because it's closer to the individual. I'd love to see, I'd love to see local principals with the help of their school community councils uh, have more budget, more authority over their budget, more hiring, training, retaining, firing power at their school. And I'd love to see a larger percentage of our education budget get to the classroom. We have such thick layers of bureaucracy in Salt Lake, and even at the districts, they could be cut out. Those are things that we need to do in our education fund. You know, last, uh, you know just one point, and then I'll. Last night, the governor mentioned how education is so important. But his basic message was more money, more money, more money. We can't just invest more money. We must invest in new ideas. And my plan is an investment in new ideas. Okay, so a question I have on that. You you said in your plan uh, that I printed here online, Common Core is not the Utah way. So why are you even going to allow a school to do sage testing? When sage testing is already proven, it's, you know, it's, uh, that encompasses the data nightmare, you know, the, the privacy invasion of all our children. Why even allow it? If, we're, it's, if Common Core is not the Utah way and federal funding, you know, we don't want any of that, why even let it linger around? Enoch, I don't think it's the Utah way. But this is, this is standing on principle. I don't want to be the governor to be the dictator. I want individuals and families and people closest to individuals and families to make the choice. And if there is a school district that says it is their way, who am I as the governor to say no to that? Well, if it, if they say it's their way, but they're implementing a federal program, then as governor, you have the you do have the authority to enforce the Tenth Amendment and say no, that's a federal program and they're not enumerated. So as a local school district, you can't implement these stage tests, right? Sure, I could say that, but again, I think that's getting in the way of a local choice. You know, my experience as a as a business person is the closer to the customer. We have people making decisions, whether it's our call center agents or people in the warehouse. Those decisions are always, they always seem to be better than the decisions that I make in the executive suite. I like to have principles and push them out that empower people to make decisions. One thing about freedom is that some people will make bad choices and some people will fail. And if some local school district or some charter school says, we want to teach Common Core, I think that's wrong, but who am I to stop them from doing that? Did you have another question on on, on the education, Enoch? Um, well, I just wanted to – one of the things that – I want to get to the callers, and we don't have much time, but I, there's some things I really want to get on the education. You talked about – it kind of – no offense, but I, it, the, the homeschooling comment was just – it was a little bit too general, like, and it wasn't specific. Can you give us more – of details of, of what you meant by what you said about homeschooling. We've actually got two minutes. Well, I, I, bit, okay, let me so go just real the, quick. Yeah. I, I love homeschooling, and if people want to homeschool, it's great. I think we need to provide a way so that they're not bearing the whole burden of that. And so what I've proposed is an optional tax credit that the parents can opt into. I don't want to force it on them. If, you know, if they're afraid that by taking a tax credit, it's going to – the government's going to seep into the way they homeschool, then they should turn it down. That's not my intention, by the way, but I don't want to force anything on anyone. You know, I was in a homeschool, Courtney and my wife and I were in a homeschooler's house uh, two nights ago when we were up in Ogden. Those kids were phenomenal, sharp, polite, succeeding, advancing through school faster than their age would suggest. Uh, I think it's great. I'd like to encourage homeschooling, but we can't force it on everyone, and I don't want the government overly involved in it. Gotcha. So um, with just the little bit of ta- time we have left, hopefully, I don't know if we can have you back to ask more questions. But um, Of course. One, uh, another question, just a- as we leave, something that, um, that politicians often do will say one thing and do another. Since you've never been in elected office, how can we trust that you'll do what you say? Okay, well, that's a great question. One is, uh, you know, one is, I'm not looking to be a career politician. I'm going to make choices not designed on what gets me reelected in four years, but on what I think is right. Uh, and I come on these shows and I go in front of people and I always tell people what I think, even when you know, sometimes they nod their head yes and sometimes they shake their head no. But my answers are consistent. Um, I want to get term limits put on the governor. We're one of only 14 states that doesn't have a term limit on our governor. Governor Herbert was pro-term limit 
six years ago when he first ran for re-election. Now he says the ballot box is the term limit. That feels to me like Golem in Lord of the Rings. He's got the ring and he wants to keep the power. That okay. won't be me. Gotcha. We're off to a break. This is Ben McClintock and Enoch Moore. We've been talking with JJ, candidate for governor. You can check out his website at hirejj.com. I'd love to have you come look there, ask questions. We answer them all. We'll be right back with more information on what's going on in Oregon.